individual didn't live in Nebraska who wrote the song or live in uh, South Dakota. He lived in Kansas, but I guess that's one of the plain states. And I think what the song expresses is that something we wish we could all experience where seldom is heard a discouraging word or where seldom is experienced a discouraging experience, but I don't know what planet you'd have to go to to have that as a reality in your life. Because when you live life on planet Earth, things are going to get discouraging once in a while. You can only imagine the discouragement and despair that must have been felt in Texas, even within our nation as a whole. Things are pretty discouraging at the time, isn't it? And, you know, sometimes we think, well, that's out there, and let's maybe bring it back to more regional. Uh, for those of us who are Husker fans, I mean, you talk about discouraging. And for the rest of you, you're sitting out there and says, who cares, you know? But let's face it, sometimes things get discouraging. Okay, let's make it personal then, okay? So you didn't get the promotion. Oh, okay, well, you didn't get the job, or worse yet, you get the most discouraging word that the company is downsizing, your position's been eliminated. Or perhaps you're getting the medical tests back and the results are pretty discouraging. And then when you get the bill, you even get more discouraged because you realize what you owe on it is far less than what you have. There's a whole lot in your life, a lot more days at the end of the month than there is dollars. And that gets pretty discouraging. Or for the things that matter most to us, the relationships in our family, maybe you and your spouse are kind of not getting along, having a hard time, pretty discouraging. Or your child's teacher calls you and says, we need to have a face-to-face -face conversation. You go away pretty discouraged. Things like that happen in our life. You can't get around it. And so that's why when we come to the Scriptures we have to look at this aspect of building community by encouraging one another. We've been in a series uh, here at church on Sunday mornings when we're talking about building community amongst Christians by exercising the one another's. And there's about 20 different one another's in the Bible. And we've covered several of them already. Today, I want to talk about encouraging one another. Now, if you're sitting here this morning and everything's hunky-dory in your life and you're just sitting here saying, I really don't need any encouraging. You might want to listen because I'm going to guess down the road a ways, if your pulse is active in your arm, you're probably going to face some discouraging times and you may need some encouragement. Or perhaps even when you look at what the Bible says, where it says encourage one another, it'll be something that you want to do. Okay, we're going to be looking at a uh, uh, several different Bible verses this morning in text, but let me just begin with Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, and we'll go down through it. In fact, let me kind of give you just a heads up. Here's what we're going to do. Regarding this aspect of encouraging one another today, we're going to look at the source of it. Where does encouraging one another come from? We're going to look at the scope of it. Who does this relate to? We're going to look at the elements of encouraging one another. What does it really look like? And then we're going to end it up by some practical. Here's how you do it. All right, so... Let's begin Hebrews 3, uh, chapter, chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews, beginning in verse 13. It simply says this, Encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Uh, another place in the Bible where it occurs, and you might want to just jot it down, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, the Bible says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encouragement, it's something that we have to practice within the body of Christ to help build community. Okay, so let's look at this. What is the source of encouragement? When it comes to encouraging others, where does it come from? In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, it gives us one of the sources, okay? It says, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. You know what that means? For some of you, you're gifted in encouraging others. It kind of comes naturally. You're really good at it. You're kind of positive. You're kind of upbeat when someone's down. You're there to encourage them. There was a guy in the New Testament. His name was Barnabas. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, it refers to him this way. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. You know how some people are kind of nicknamed or they're named after some particular characteristic of them? You know, you've got... Big Ben or Tiny Tim or whatever the case may be. This guy uh, was Barnabas, the son of encouragement. 
I think he's the kind of guy I'd like to be around. Okay? Especially if things weren't going very well. So he was a natural in it. He was gifted. In fact, in, in Romans 12, uh, 8, it says, sometimes you may be gifted to encourage others. And that, if that is the case, then be encouraging. But for others, for the rest of us who it does not come naturally, you know what you need? You need God's grace to help you to be encouraging others. And I think probably more of us can be identified with this. It's kind of like the guy who was going to take a trip to Rome. And so about a week before he was going to go to Rome, uh, he went to his barber to get a haircut. And his barber, in the course of getting the hair, giving me the haircut, says, hey, what's happening? Is anything neat? He says, yeah, I'm taking a trip to Rome next week. His barber says, really? You're going to Rome? He goes, yeah. So uh, what airline are you flying on? He gives the name of the airline. And he goes, oh, uh, be prepared. You take a pillow with you when you go to the airport because they always are running behind. Sometimes they miss their, their flights. and You may miss a connection. And so they're always late. And the other thing that they're selling for is they're notorious for losing luggage. And so you make, better make sure you've got a change of clothes with you and, and you know, be prepared to be late. And if you have a connecting flight, you'll probably miss it. Oh, okay. Uh, and he says, so when you get to Rome, where are you going to stay? And he gives the name of the motel. And he goes, oh, no, I've heard a lot of bad about that motel too. Some of the places that uh, people have gone, to that, have gone to Rome, stayed at the motel, they said they didn't even change the sheets before they got there. And the food was really, really bad at that motel. So you're going to have to eat out a lot also. The guy goes, oh, okay, I'll keep that in mind. Finally, he says to him, so like when you're in Rome, what are you going to do? And the guy who's taking the trip says to his barber, he says, I'm going to see the Pope. He goes, see the Pope? Fat chance buster. The Pope doesn't see common, ordinary people like you. You're never going to get an audience with the Pope. He's all caught up with dignitaries and kings and presidents, and he has no time for anybody in his schedule for ordinary people like you. And so the guy pays his uh, barber for the haircut, walks out, it's about six weeks later or so, he comes back for another haircut after his trip. And the barber says, hey, tell me how your trip to Rome went. He said, really good. The flight was on time and the airlines didn't lose my luggage. And the motel that we stayed at was fantastic. I'd give it a five-star rating. And the barber's going, really? And he said, and he told the barber, you know what? And I had a chance to have an audience with the Pope. The barber said, you had a chance to see the Pope and talk with the Pope? Well, what did you say to him? He said, well, I knelt down and I kissed his ring and the Pope looked at me and said, my son, where in the world did you ever get such a lousy haircut? <laughs> Unfortunately, for some of us, we're more like the barber, aren't we? We, we take reality seriously rather than desire and we're a little bit negative. And so... You need God's grace. Now, I want to pause just for a second here because, you know, you ever been to church and we throw out these terms, you know, grace? Let's see, grace. Is that my uncle or my aunt? Or No, no, that's my aunt, isn't it? Okay, grace. We believe that God is a God of grace, which means this. God is able to, through His grace, through His power, through His influence in our lives, to cause us, to enable us, to woo us, to empower us, to do what He would want us to do. And it starts with salvation. The Bible teaches that all of us are separated from a holy God because of our sin, but because God is a God of grace and mercy, He moved in our lives. He gave us His Son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and died on the cross for our sin. And so therefore, the, te the teaching of our Bible today is that salvation, eternal life, forgiveness is found by faith in Jesus Christ. And at the moment we enter into a relationship by faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says we have been saved by God's grace. And that's what we need. And that's just the start. The Bible also teaches very clearly that throughout the Christian life, we need God's grace to help us to live the Christian life. Because if you haven't read it recently, there's a lot in here that asks us and tells us to do things that we don't want to do. In fact, it seems to sometimes just caught cut kind of cross-culture or cross-counter to who we are as individuals. And that's why we need God's grace. And so we're saved by God's grace and we need to live by God's grace. And if we're going to be uh, active in encouraging one another, sometimes we're going to need God's grace in order to do that. 
So where does it come from? It comes from God, ultimately. Whether you're gifted or whether you need His help to do it. Okay, let's look at the second part of encouraging one another. Who does this really relate to? Romans chapter 1. I want to take a look at verses 11 and 12. Okay, this is, this is really a good verse. The Apostle Paul is writing here. Notice what he says. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. And in fact, if you read it in the New American Standard Bible, it adds this phrase at the end, both yours and mine. Did you ever hear things um, taught or said in the Scripture and you have a tendency, yeah, that's, that's them. That's not me. Yeah, uh, encouragement is what leaders do. Um, encouragement is what others do whose life who's going really well for them. They encourage those who need encouragement. Well, let's go back and let's see what God is really see, what He's really saying here. First of all, He's saying this aspect of encouraging one another relates to all believers. Latter part of the verse. That is, you, plural, and I. It's all believers. Paul didn't say, I'm going to come and encourage you. He said, you and I, reciprocal, I'm going to encourage you and you're going to encourage me. Now, what does that tell you? The Apostle Paul needed encouragement? I mean, this is a guy who wrote most of the New Testament. Why in the world would he need encouragement? Because he faces discouraging times also. It's part of being alive. And so, encouraging one another is something that we all do. It relates to all of us. Now, there's something else we need to observe here in it also. It's in the first few words of the verse. I long to see you. We're talking about the role of proximity or being in the presence of others. Um, if we're going to develop some community here within our church, it means we need to be in the presence of others. We need to be in close proximity to others. Now, sometimes I realize that getting used to a group of people is a process. I understand that. Uh, some of you are a little bit more reserved in the way that you relate to others. God, I, God knows that. I know that. Others of you are a little bit more outgoing. But if you're more of the reserved type, I want to challenge you. Go ahead and get in the proximity or the presence of others so that you can develop a sense of community. Connecting in community, how in the world do we really do that? Well, uh, if you're new, here's what we're going to encourage you to do. Uh, as you go out the door on the right-hand side, there's a clipboard there. If you're not on our church's email list, I want to encourage you to give us your email address. Put your name and give us your information there. Because when it comes to events, when it comes to prayer requests, what's happening, um, we email uh, things out to people on our uh, email page. Also, you can log in to our church's website and uh, you can get all sorts of good information where you can connect with us here, okay? Uh, so in order to do that, you've got to take a step in order to get connected because it's for all of us. It's not just uh, for those who are really um, with it, so to speak. Okay, I want to give you an example about that. In the Old Testament, uh, in the history of the nation of Israel, they came to a point uh, in their history where they wanted a king. It wasn't God's desire, but it was their desire. And so God kind of relented and said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a king. The very first king of the nation of Israel, his name was Saul. Not a good guy, okay? He looked really good on the outside. In fact, that's why the people chose him, because he, looked, he was attractive and he looked sharp and, and macho and everything. They thought, we want this guy to be our king. Unfortunately, he had a lot of wrong on the inside. And when it came time to God was going to, in a supernatural way, demote him, and he was going to elevate then the next king to the throne, whose name was David. Ended up being a, a good king. Had his faults, had his fall, but he was still a good king. When Saul became aware that he wasn't going to be king anymore, and he still was king, and he found out that David was going to be the next king, you know what he did? He started out on a mission to find David and kill him and eliminate him. That's what you do when you're a king. Somebody's threatening your throne, you eliminate him, right? And so David is on the run from Saul. And he's hiding out in the wilderness of Judea. And he's afraid that Saul's going to find him. 
David had a best friend. It's really interesting, unique, who David's best friend was. You know who it was? <laughs> Saul's son, Jonathan. Interesting family dynamics there. Can't you just imagine? Jonathan finds out that uh, David is hiding from his father out in the wilderness of Judea, and so he can't help but he can't get him from his mind. He keeps thinking, being on the run from the king and you're, you can't be at home with your family and you're, you're camping out in the wilderness, I've got to go find David in order to encourage him. And so here's what it says in the Bible he does in 1 Samuel 23, verses 15 and 16. Now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horish and encouraged him in God. And if you read the next verse, you know what it says. He told, you know, he told David this. He said, David, you know, don't be fearful. Be encouraged because my father's not going to find you and you're going to assume his throne. Now, if I'm on the run from somebody who's trying to kill me, I'm encouraged by that. Okay? What a great example. Underscore the fact that Jonathan arose and he went and he spoke encouraging words to David. You want to know what the first step sometimes is, is ministering to others through encouraging? Just going and seeking them out and giving them some good positive news, even in the fact that the fact of the matter may be they may not be in a good situation. All right, so we've looked at the source of encouraging. That's God working within us. The, the scope is all of us. So let's look at some of the characteristics or the elements. What does it really look like? All right, first and foremost, one of the, the, the primary thing that you encourage people with, and I touched on this, is you encourage people with words. A couple of verses we want to look at together. First of all, Acts chapter 15, verse uh, 32. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. They needed encouragement. Why? Because, let's face it, you've ever been discouraged in your Christian life? Yeah, you, you need a little bit of encouragement. So you've got guys that are going out and they're speaking a lot of words of encouragement because we know sometimes it can be very discouraging. The story was told that uh, Satan was having a sale. Um, he was putting his tools up for sale. On the date of the sale, the tools were placed for public inspection, each being marked with its sale price. They were a treacherous lot of tools. Hatred, envy, jealousy, doubt, lying, pride, and so on. And laid apart from the rest of the pile was a harmless-looking tool. Well-worn, but it was priced very high. The name of the tool, asked one of the purchasers. Oh, said the adversary, that's discouragement. Oh, why have you priced it so high? Satan replied, because it's more useful to me than all of the others. I can pry open and get inside of a person's heart with that one. And when I cannot get near him with any of the other tools, this one works. Now, once I get inside, I can make him do what I choose. It's a badly worn tool because I use it on almost everyone since few people know that it belongs to me. The devil's price for discouragement was so high he never sold it. It's still his major tool that he uses today to afflict God's people. I think we'd all have to say, yeah, been there. That tool has been used on me. So why do we need encouragement? Because discouragement just seems to go along. If you're a Christian here today, you're, you're discouraged. You know what? That's okay. We hope and we believe that you'll experience God's encouragement as we look together in His Word, as you seek Him, and as you rub shoulders with others. Not just thinking that they have it all together, but that, you know what, we can encourage each other as we go through difficult times together. All right, so encouraging others with words. However, there's another aspect to that, <clears throat> that if we really um, put it into practice will really help. It's encouraging others with simple word deeds, doing something. Uh, I think many of you are aware that uh, our daughter and son-in-law living in Kentucky are facing discouraging times. Our son-in-law has an autoimmune disease and physically he's, 
he's somewhat incapacitated. And uh, so a lot of the normal type stuff of anything physical nature has to be done by my daughter. And uh, a tree went down in the yard. And uh, praise be to God that in the church people knew about it and uh, the associate pastor grabs his chainsaw and goes out and trims up that tree and also cut down a couple other trees. You know how encouraging that was to our daughter? When someone showed up, and she didn't even ask them, he got the news, the information, and he automatically thought, you know what, uh, I, I just can't say be encouraged. I've got to go out and encourage them by doing something. So my challenge to you is, a, is this. If, if, it, if it's in, within your power, or you have the means of actually doing something to encourage somebody, especially for those of you who are men of few words, <laughs> go do it. Because those actions are speaking much louder than any words that you could ever speak. And so therefore, we encourage one another by doing it. Discouragement makes you want to quit. And so what we're going to do is, with words and acts of service, we're going to encourage one another. All right, so we know what it, where it comes from, who it relates to, it's all of us, what it looks like. How about some practical how-tos, and then we're going to hear a true-to-life story about how some of you know how this works. All right, several things. If you're going to be one who encourages others, three basic things I want to give you to get you started this morning. Number one is this. Be available. Did you ever notice that we always have time for the things that are most important in our lives or the things we enjoy most doing? And so it's a matter of just getting our priorities right, isn't it? Um, to where you say, you know what, I, I think this is where God wants me to be at. And so the first thing is I'm going to say to God, okay, I'm available, be available. And you would say something like this to the Lord. Lord, I'm willing to learn by your grace, for those of you in whom you're not gifted, it doesn't come naturally, to be an encourager. Or you begin in your mind to ask yourself the question, how can I encourage this person? Why? Because encouraging one another is both a supernatural gift and a learned art. You learn how to do it. So be available. Always remember this. God's not so interested in your ability as he is your availability. So to be used to God isn't by virtue of ability, it's by being available. Where you just simply say, okay, Lord, here's who I am in all my flawed capacities, in all my weaknesses. Lord, I'm just saying I'm available. Go ahead and use me. Second thing is be intentional. Remember when Jonathan wanted to go out and uh, encourage David? He actually got up and went. He just didn't sit back and think about it and thought, yeah, I ought to do something. He was intentional about it. He got up and he showed up. So we need to be intentional about closing the gap of distance between ourselves and others so that we can get connected. Now, a little bit of announcement here, all right? Very practical way to do that. Next Sunday, uh, I'm looking forward to getting connected to more of you. We've been here about five months now and starting to develop some connections with you. Uh, and, and by the way, you're all good so far, okay? So, so be encouraged by that. You're all good. Do you, know? you ever notice how you always hope, I hope he never learns that or finds this out about me, and it's kind of like, don't worry about it. I, I realize we're all work in progress here. And I, I'm not so concerned about where you're at as where you're going, you know? Because we're all on that line of continuum where God is taking us where we're at and trying to get us to where we need to be. And I'm not so concerned about where you're at. Is, are you moving in the right direction? And I fully were at where and realize that sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. That's kind of like what it is sometimes. All right, so next Sunday at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a Thanksgiving potluck service here. And, you know, there's no greater thing to do to get together people than to eat, Right? Well, at least from my perspective anyway. But we're going to have a potluck supper, and it'll be a great opportunity for you to cut some of the distance between you and some of the brothers and sisters here. And so we want to encourage you to do that. 
Um, maybe you're not aware of Wednesday nights at 5.30, we have a little meal here. And then at 6.30, our Wednesday night ministry starts. If you've got kids, grade school kids, we've got ministry for grade school kids downstairs. For junior high and high school kids, we've got that going on upstairs. For adults, if you've never been in a Bible study, we do one here on Wednesday nights. And we want to invite you, in fact, encourage you to be intentional and come and be a part of that. Get up and show up. All right, third, third thing to do, be vocal. Vocalize and get those words of encouragement. It's probably the best place to start. Um, you've got a smartphone, you text all the time. Do you realize how easy it is to text a very brief message to someone and just let them know, you know, I've been thinking about you. And I'm hoping that God will help you. Something short and sweet and to the point. They don't need a sermon. And you don't need to be able to have to give a sermon. How simple and how easy that is when out of the nowhere, somebody's you know, needing, is a little discouraged and needs some encouragement, up pops, wow, so-and-so was thinking about me. I, they must care about me. I'm encouraged by that. So be vocal about it. Um, what do I say? Well, probably the best thing to say would be put yourself in their shoes. If you were in their shoes, what would you need to hear? Proverbs 12.25 says, Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Maybe you're good at writing things out or finding the right card. Um, we're, I'm personally thankful for those of you on that Pastor Appreciation Sunday you gave us cards. Thank you so much. And so I know some of you realize that greeting cards are a good way maybe to say something that you couldn't say. I was out on, on Google because I was wondering, encouraging cards, I ran across one, and it goes like this. Success is how high you bounce after you hit bottom. <laughs> I thought, that is encouraging and it is so true. <laughs> a good way to say it. Accentuate the positive and, and just say it. So be available, be intentional, and be vocal. It was five weeks ago this Sunday. For those of you that were here, you saw Aaron and his family get up and rush out, and you know the rest of the story where Tori uh, was involved, uh, Tori Hansen was involved in a very serious auto accident. And um, I, I want to commend you because many of you have really help them and encourage them and strengthen him. And so I've asked Aaron if he would come up this morning and share with you in a few minutes uh, how that, what you have done has encouraged them and strengthened them. So I'm going to ask Aaron if you want to get out of your seat right now. He, are you stuck there, bud? Uh, come on up and, and share with us um, how we have encouraged you. Oop, let me get a microphone for you here. Do we have one back there? All right, hold the thought, because we've got to get you mic'd. Oh, there we go. When uh, Pastor Barry asked me, actually first he told me what he was preaching on, the encouraging one another, and he said, would you want to share anything with the church? And my first thought was, man, where do I start? And uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, as Pastor Barry alluded to, uh, the, the circumstances that have happened in my life over the last month. Uh, for those that don't, I know there are some new faces in here, just, just real quick. It was five Sundays ago, um, my daughter, her mother, and her stepfather uh, were driving to Sioux Falls for a softball tournament. And while they were driving, a, another vehicle uh, ran a stop sign uh, at, I don't know exactly, but I'm assuming above 55 miles an hour, and T-boned the vehicle that my, my daughter was in. She was wearing her seatbelt, but the, the force of the collision 
uh, catapulted her out of her seat and through the back window, uh, leaving her lying on the side of the road. And ultimately, a whole bunch of broken bones from her neck to her ribs, her pelvis, her arm, her leg. She was, she was stabilized. It's a miracle that she was even alive, let alone not paralyzed. Uh, she was ultimately life flighted up to Sioux Falls, where we would spend the next three weeks. And so that's the, the horrible part of the story, or at least a portion of it. For those that have been following the journey um, over the last few weeks, you know about the pain that she's in. Uh, you know about the prayer requests that we've been uh, firing out to you. And you know about the progress that she is making. But what I want to focus on just right now is the, the praise. Uh, the, the praise that I've had towards God through this, I've kind of uh, shared uh, in different forms. But really, I want to praise you. Uh, this church, Discovery Church, has been unbelievable. You folks have supported my family beyond anything that we could have imagined. Your prayers, your financial resources, your food, your, really your love. We felt your love. This church came together, each according, as Pastor Barry said, each according to your own gifts. And maybe it was just your time coming up to the hospital. It just meant so much to our family. For fear of not forgetting somebody, or for fear of forgetting somebody, I don't want to name names, but if you gave to my family, whether really, your time, um, your financial resources, your food, um, we felt it, and we, we greatly appreciate it, and you guys are awesome. Um, I want you to know that, or how encouraging it was to us, uh, reading your posts, reading your letters, um, just incredible. Um, and I also want you to know that I've been sharing some of those with Tori. Uh, you can imagine she's kind of down in the dumps. Uh, she's feeling sorry for herself. Um, and so I, I remember one night I was sharing some of the posts with her. And she was encouraged. You, you could just... could just see it. I mean, it just, it, it was to smile. Just a card, nothing in it, just a card is just awesome. Uh, she is in so much pain. She's in, she's so scared of what's to come. But you guys have all been so encouraging to us and to her, and I want you to know that. I love you. Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to commend you uh, for responding uh, to the Hanson family the way that you have. Um, I want you to know that you're a source of God's light in someone's life when you encourage them, especially uh, in circumstances like this. And I, I think it would be important for us to kind of take a statement home and maybe fill in the blanks and maybe have this in the front of our minds, which I think it's in your bulletins there. I will encourage, and you can fill in the blank, by and whatever it is you're going to do or say. Um, I think it's important sometimes for us to say, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to be intentional in doing this. 
and I'm going to step out and do it. For some of you, you're already doing that, and I commend you. For the other of us, we need to start. We need to start. And there's no place like now for starting. I mentioned 1 Thessalonians 5.11 uh, earlier, and uh, as I was looking that one up this week and just looking at it in various translations, in the Phillips paraphrase, it goes like this. So go on cheering and strengthening each other with thoughts like these, as I have no doubt you have already been doing. And I thought that pretty well sums it up here, I think. Keep it on, keep doing it, because you have already been doing it.